this edition of Connect with Skip, you can expect strong biblical direction about dealing with the challenges of isolation and finding God's grace in unlikely places. This is Scott Dooley, and I'm glad you've joined us as we consider the ultimate shelter. This is Skip, and before we start today's message, I want to let you know that we have several reading plans in the YouVersion app. From the first book of the Bible, we have You Can Understand the Book of Genesis plan to the book of Revelation, a plan called What's Next? Just search my name, Skip Heitzig, in the YouVersion app to find all of our reading plans. Now, here's the ultimate shelter. Hey, Job, you just lost your, um, your servants. Uh-oh. You just lost all your animals. Uh-oh. Uh, your house fell down. Uh-oh. Your children are dead. Big uh-oh. Then his health is lost. Uh-oh. But this is not an uh-oh moment. This is an ah moment. He gets this epiphany, this revelation of truth that helps him transcend what he is going through. It's like the, the curtains f uh, open up and light floods into the room. At, one, at this point, one commentator called Job the Neil Armstrong of faith, taking one small step for man, but one giant leap for mankind. I love that. This statement is one of those kind of statements. So he's looking for and looking to a redeemer. Now, by the way, redeemer is one of the titles for God in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 6, speaking of the Exodus out of Egypt, he said, I am the Lord, and I will free you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a mighty hand. Isaiah the prophet saw God as a redeemer. That great chapter, chapter 43, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. A redeemer, God as a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, if you will. Now, the greatest example in all of Scripture, the pinnacle fulfillment of a kinsman redeemer, a goel, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the perfect picture of a redeemer because what he did is redeem mankind. He paid the price for the sin of everyone. So Paul uses this idea of a kinsman redeemer in Romans 3, 24, when he writes, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, through him we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So he's looking for a redeemer, and here's what you need to know about a kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament. A kinsman redeemer could only redeem if he met three qualifications. Number one, he had to be related. That's obvious. Number two, he had to be able. And number three, he had to be willing. So let me kind of go through that. First of all, he had to be related. You have to be a blood relative to redeem somebody else in your family or to restore something to the family lineage. You have to be a blood relative. Now, this is the reason for the incarnation. This is the reason God became a man. He joined the, the, the blood bank of the human race, the bloodline of the human race. He stepped out of glory, went past the constellations into the Milky Way galaxy to a speck of dust called Earth to a stable in Bethlehem to join the human race as somebody related to us. Second, you had to be able to pay the price. It's one thing to come up and say, I'd like to redeem that person's land. You have to cough up the big bucks. You have to write a check that won't bounce. Yeah. And so Jesus had to be able to pay the price. What, what did he pay the price with? What was his currency? Blood. It was his own blood. First Peter said, we were not redeemed, there's the word, with corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he had to be related, had to be able, and had to be willing. And to me, this is the most amazing thing about Jesus, is that he wasn't forced into it. He didn't have to be talked into it. He willingly gave himself, voluntarily gave himself. 
He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. So he meets all the qualifications of a kinsman redeemer. He's related, he's able, and he is willing. I heard a beautiful story about a Christian woman who adopted a Jewish daughter. Here's the backstory. It was when Adolf Hitler invaded Poland and annexed Poland. And the Nazi soldiers came into a, a town in Poland to cordon off the city and to force all the occupants of the city under the railroad cars to take them to concentration camps to die. As a Nazi soldier was pushing a line of people, there was a woman and he was pushing her toward the railroad car and he noticed a little girl and said to the woman, and it was her daughter, is that your daughter? And the woman looked up in a panic look and looked up and saw a Christian woman from that town who was not being arrested and pleadingly said, no, it's her daughter. And so that Christian woman took that Jewish girl home and adopted her and raised her as her own. She acted as the redeemer, willingly and able to do and change the future of that child forever. The shelter we need, the ultimate shelter we need is not a stimulus package or a check from the government. The ultimate shelter we need is not a vaccine from the coronavirus. The ultimate shelter we need is in the person, a personal relationship with God's son, Jesus Christ. You can have the wisdom of Solomon. You can have the talent of a rock star. You could have the health of a young athlete. You could have the patience of Job. You could have the compassion of Mother Teresa. But you still need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from your sin. Christianity is not a creed. It's a person. It's not an institution. It's a person. It's not a ritual. It's a person. And Jesus is that person. So for Job, his ultimate shelter was a person called a redeemer. He calls him a redeemer. But notice what he says about his redeemer. He's alive. I know that my redeemer lives. Now, whoever he's speaking about, at his time period, remember, he's writing in the patriarchal period, the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Whomever Job is thinking about in his mind, Job knows he's alive and well. Some people interpret this as Job simply saying, there's got to be somebody out there who's alive, who really gets me, who understands me, and who can help me. But I don't see it as that. If I read the context of this carefully in this passage, this is not wishful thinking like, I hope somebody's out there who understands me. It's more than a hope so. Right. Job is identifying somebody called a redeemer who is alive, and that same person, he says, will be alive at the end of time. I know that my redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last, or the NIV says, in the end he shall stand in the end on the earth. He shall stand in the end on the earth. Boy, does that sound New Testament. Not Old Testament. It sounds very New Testament. Remember, Jesus said in Revelation 1, I am he who lives and was dead and am alive forevermore. After the resurrection, when the disciples came to the tomb, the angel said, what are you doing looking for the dead, the living among the dead? In Romans chapter 6, the apostle wrote, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. Question, why did Job mention that his redeemer lived? Why, why, why a living redeemer? Easy answer. A dead redeemer can't help anybody. Only a living one can. Only a living redeemer can redeem. It's like a doctor. A dead doctor can't help patients. A dead farmer can't plant or plow a field. A dead builder can't build anything. And a dead redeemer can't redeem. It takes a living redeemer to buy back land, to free slaves, to restore an inheritance. It has to be somebody who's active and alive. Why do I bring that up so emphatically? Here's why. So many people are willing to trust the teachings of some dead guy. 
So, wow, he gave us these great teachings, but death won. Death won. He's dead. He said some nice things, but I bet you say some nice things too from time to time. But people aren't laying their lives down for you in the same way. Jesus is different. You know, so many people follow Buddha or Muhammad. Muhammad died in 632 AD. He was placed in a tomb. And to this day, thousands, no, hundreds of thousands of people every year visit the tomb of Muhammad for one reason, to mourn his death. Every Easter, millions of Christians around the world gather together to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. He conquered death. He is a living redeemer. Yeah. I love the um, conversation that an atheist was having with a little girl, and he thought he was so smart, and said to the little girl, who said she was a Christian, didn't care what the atheist said. He, she believed in Jesus as the Lord, as the Messiah, and the atheist said, well, so many people have claimed to be the Messiah. How can you be sure who told the truth? Who are you going to believe? And she said, that's easy. The guy who got up from the dead. That's the one I'm going to believe. A lot of people make a lot of claims, but Jesus rose from the grave. So Job's ultimate shelter is in a person. Second, his shelter is personal. Not just a person, it's personal. Um, listen to what Job says about this living redeemer. For I know that my... Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. Notice he is specific and not generic. He's not saying there is a redeemer out there somewhere, or one of many redeemers. He's not saying, um, let me tell you about my mom's redeemer or my family's redeemer. This is my redeemer. You see, a lot of people talk about God, but they talk about him secondhand. You know, they talk about the good Lord the big guy upstairs, you know, all the little stupid things that people call God that reveal they don't have a real personal contact with him. Is he your Lord? Is he your savior? Is he your redeemer? You know, it's like, it's like uh, my wife, um, before we married, before June 13th, 1981, I could say, look, there's a girl. Or, hey, do you know that girl? But on June 13th, 1981, every day thereafter, I could say, hey, look, there's my girl. He's my redeemer. I know that my redeemer lives. Do you have that my in your relationship with your redeemer or just a secondhand experience? Paul wrote to young, young Timothy about his own faith, but Paul said it this way, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, but I am persuaded is in you also. Yes, it's your grandma's faith and your mom's religion, but it's your personal relationship now. That's all the difference. It's like what Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Not, well, do you come from a good spiritual background? You have to have your own personal contact and commitment to Christ. Nobody can do it for you. There's no two-for-one specials. There's no family rate salvation packages. This week only, you have to come one at a time. And if you haven't come to Christ yet, if it's not personal, that can change. And it needs to change. So his shelter is personal. He is specific, not generic. My Redeemer and he's confident, not hesitant. I, I want you to notice twice, uh, once in verse 25 and once in verse 26, he uses the term, I know. Not I think, not I hope, not I wish, but I know. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I will see God. In the original Hebrew, it's very emphatic. It's I, yes, I know. So it's put in the emphatic form. Now, this is important because there's a lot that Job did not know. And he brings that up in the book. In the book, I mentioned early on that there's 330 questions more than any other book in Scripture that the book of Job asks. There's a lot Job didn't know. Even in verse 23, he said, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Now, of course, 
they really are now, right? We're reading them. But he didn't know that. Um, his suffering is because there was a conversation between God and the devil. We know that, but Job didn't know that. He didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. So there's a lot Job didn't know, but now he knows something. Now he's very, very confident. He moves from hoping to knowing. Let me say this to you. Never give up what you do know because of what you don't know. There's a lot of things you don't know and you can't answer and won't be able to figure out even though you want to and you pray about it and you search for them. But there's some things you do know. Hold on to those. Never give up what you do know for what you don't know. Now, if you're a Christian, you should know it. You should have confidence in it. You should have a rock-solid assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. You can have that. You know, the Bible promises assurance. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, probably the best verse on this subject. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. If somebody asks me, Skip, do you think you're going to go to heaven? I go, no, I don't think I'm going to heaven. I know I am. I know I am. Now, I once asked a clergyman when I was searching. This is before I came to Christ. I once asked a clergyman in the faith I grew up with, um, how can I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die? And he basically said, you can't know until you die. I go, well, I really want to go to heaven. How can I know that? He goes, well, when you die, you'll know. And I remember saying to him, that's a little late, isn't it, to find out you were wrong? I mean, what if you went to the doctor and uh, the doctor said, you may have cancer, but then again, you may not. And you were to say, well, doc, how can I know? And he said, well, if you die from it, we know you had it. Well, that wouldn't be very helpful, a diagnosis. That's a little bit too late. So you can know. You can have assurance. You can have this same kind of assurance. I've had people ask me, well, how, how can you be so sure you're saved? Easy. I was there when it happened. I remember the incident itself. I remember my heart being changed in the moment. And though I didn't hear a voice, though I didn't see a light, I felt unburdened. I felt relieved. And, and my life changed and people who knew me saw it. I was there when it happened. Now, that's not arrogance. That's just confidence. Confidence is believing what God said. That's not arrogance. That's confidence. In fact, to believe what God said isn't arrogance. It's humility. You're bowing yourself before his revelation. But you can know. And I want to drill that in. You can know. Um, uh, somebody sent me a photograph. I have the pictures. I have two pictures. Uh, I read about it in a book, but I didn't know if it was a true headstone. But somebody sent me a photograph from a cemetery back in New England. And it's inscribed, pause, stranger, as you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. Wow. As I am now, so you will be. Yeah. So prepare for death and follow me. Ooh, it's a great headstone. Yeah. Somebody was walking by past that and read it and wrote something and left it on the grave that says, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> I don't know which way you went, but I know which way I'm going to go. And I hope you can have that assurance as well. And you can. Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know that after my skin is destroyed and my flesh, I will see God. So his shelter is a person. His shelter is personal. Finally, and we'll close with this, his ultimate shelter is perpetual. It's never going to end. It's not going to stop after a little period of time. He speaks of his own eventual death, but also eternal life in verse 26 and 27. L listen to these great words. After my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh, hmm, wait a minute. After my skin is destroyed, in my flesh, I will see God, it continues, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Now, this is Hebrew poetry. 
you can see how it's written out in the page in, in your Bible, the way it's written. It's called Hebrew parallelism. So this is a uh, Hebrew poetic way of saying, I got no hope in this life, but I believe in a future bodily resurrection. That's really what it is saying. Job pierces beyond the grave. He knows he's going to die. He, he knows his body at some point will decay, but he knows he's going to live forever. He says, my flesh is going to be destroyed. Whether joy is, uh, Job is enjoying life at home, living the life of Riley. I don't even know what that means, but that's a saying. Living it up. <laughs> With his servants and all his children and things are good and the economy is good, or... He's scraping himself on an ash heap with a piece of pottery. He knows either way he has an expiration date. He's terminal. He's going to die. They're going to put him under the ground one day. He will die. It's like the cab driver said to his client. He said, you know, life is a lot like a taxi cab ride. He said, the meter keeps going whether you're going somewhere or just standing still. And so is your life. You are going somewhere. Where is it you're going? Because the meter is ticking and you and I have an expiration date. Job knew that. And he knew that his shelter would outlast and outlive him. He knew that in this same body that he had with those same eyes, mm -hmm. he would see God. How? There's only one explanation, a resurrection. If he says my body's going to decay, but in my flesh I'm going to see God, how, how is that even possible? The only way it's possible is a resurrected body. So get this. Here's Job, centuries before Christ, centuries before the resurrection, centuries before the New Testament, living at the time of the patriarchs, yet confident in bodily resurrection. Why is that important? It means that the resurrection or belief in the resurrection is not a new concept, not just a New Testament concept. It goes all the way back as part of God's consistent revelation. It's way back. It's way old. A kid wrote a letter to God. Dear God, my grandpa said you were alive when he was a kid. Just how far back do you go? <laughs> well, God goes back pretty far. Uh, farther than you or I or grandpa or great grandpa. He goes all the way back and his revelation goes back. And the consistency of the resurrection goes back, his promises. So our shelter is perpetual. It will, it will outlast wrinkles. <laughs> Aren't I glad? In this era of high-definition cameras, <laughs> I am so glad that my hope is perpetual. And it will outlast aches and pains and disease and economic downfall. Yes. Our hope is forever. Amen. Now, friends, brothers and sisters, family of God, if Job had this conviction centuries before Christ, how much more should we have this conviction? Post-Christ. Jesus, our Savior, said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. Then he proved his words by walking out of the tomb. He said, because I live, you also will live. My question is, do you believe that? Do you personally believe that? He's a living redeemer, but is he your living redeemer? And do you know it? You might live to be 60 years of age. You might live to be 25 years of age. You might live to be 100 years old on the earth, but you will live forever somewhere, heaven or hell. This earth, this life, whether you're like Job in a diseased state, or you're like Job before this, and you're wealthy and happy and everything's great, which I doubt there's a lot of those around after the coronavirus. We're all affected by it. But know this. This earth is a warm-up act. That's all it is. It's a dress rehearsal. I just hope you're ready for the real show. You're going to see God one day. There's going to be a resurrection for the just and the unjust, the scriptures clearly teach. Are you ready to meet him? Well, if you're not, you can be. It's pretty simple, and the reason we're so confident about it is the Bible makes promise after promise that you can easily leave your life now and step into a brand new life in faith, an act of faith, a prayer of faith.
a simple step of saying yes to Jesus, you say, well, it just sounds so, I don't know, elementary, so easy, too easy. Uh, if you tell me I need to make a pilgrimage across the world, may maybe that would make me feel better. If I have to crawl on my knees to a holy place and get bloodied up, maybe that's better. If I have to say a whole lot of prayers, I'll feel better like I've done something. You can't do anything because salvation is unattainable. Yeah. That's why God said, I'll give it to you as a gift. If you just believe in me and believe that what my son did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago is enough, I'll give it to you as a gift. No strings attached, free. That's where you have to humble yourself and be confident in God's revelation to you. That's Skip Heitzig with a much needed message about finding the ultimate shelter of grace in times of shaken foundations. Now, we want to tell you about our resource from Levi Lusco. It's the hardcover book, Take Back Your Life. I bet that intriguing title resonates with you. Let's find out more. I think one of the things that we all feel, if we're honest, is that we're stuck where we are and that we're always going to be here. What I think God wants you to see is that with what you have now, the life you have now, the marriage you have now can become brand new. In my book, Take Back Your Life, I've given all of my war notes, all of the correspondence from my own struggle to take back my life so that hopefully my hindsight can become your foresight. The reason I wrote the book and put the video study together was for you to have some helpful handles to take your life back from the things that are holding you back so that you can forge ahead into all that God has for you. Take Back Your Life, a book by Levi Lusco, is a 40-day interactive journey and available to you now for a donation. Order your copy by calling 1-800-922-1888 or go to connectwithskip.com. That's 1-800-922-1888. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us on Connect with Skip Heitzig. We're connecting you to God's never-changing truth in ever-changing times.